Well, hello. Today we're going to continue looking at sine and cosine graphs. Today we're going to focus on lesson 6-4, which deals with amplitude and period of sine and cosine graphs. We're going to look at this idea today. We're going to look at these ideas from the perspective of function transformations. So we're going to see how adding, subtracting, multiplying numbers inside of these functions, how that affects the shape of the graph. And again, one of our goals for this particular chapter is to become so comfortable with graphing trig functions that it's almost as easy for us to do as, say, your ability to graph linear functions at the moment. In other words, my expectation is you should be able to look at the functional form of an equation and be able to sketch a rough outline of what the, what the graph looks like, getting the details correct without having to plug in points or plug into your calculator. And of course, that's going to mean that our chapter test on this chapter will be without a calculator, at least in part. Well, let's take a look at the information that we're looking at today, and, and we'll go ahead and get started. We want to look at function transformation. So this is a brief review of the relevant function transformations that we will need to see for our work um, today. Recall that a function transformation is something we do to the function that in turn affects the graph and transforms the graph in some, some way. So, for example, one of the first transformations we looked at early in trimester one was the transformation that takes f of x and simply multiplies it by some constant a. If you recall, the result of this transformation was a vertical dilation, a vertical stretch by a factor of a. So a vertical dilation by a factor of a. And what we would like to do is we would like to see how this change now specifically affects trig functions, the sine and the cosine um, that we saw in Lesson 6-3. So if we take a, a, a moment here to just draw a rough sketch of this basic trig function, the original trig function here, and again, we'll, we'll do that over a, a domain of 0 to 2 pi. Recall that the sine function has a shape. It starts off at the origin. This should be something that you're feeling more comfortable with now. And has a, a maximum height and a minimum height of positive 1 and minus 1. So here, for example, would be the graph of the function y equals the sine of x. How is an a value how is an a value going to change this? So in other words, if in the same graph we wanted to look at the equation y is equal to 3 times the sine of x, how would that 3 affect the graph? In what ways would the graph change? Maybe you can take a moment and think about that in terms of the transformations that you already know. When you're ready, go ahead and continue on with the lesson. So we'll go ahead and, and actually take a look at an example of this. I happen to have a a um, demonstration here we can look at a little interactive computer simulation so to speak this is a graph of our basic sine function so this is just y equals the sine of x you can verify this because of the shape it has a period of 2 pi so here is 2 pi and you can see the function repeats itself once in the space of 2 pi with a maximum value at pi over 2 of 1 and a minimum value at 3 pi over 2 of minus 1. So this is, a, this is the sine graph, the standard sine graph, just as we graphed a moment ago. But what I can do here is I can change what's called the amplitude. I can change the coefficient multiplying the sine function. At the moment, I'm simply multiplying it by 1, so there's no change to the graph. But as we increase the amplitude, as we say move the amplitude from 1 to 2, you can see that the height our function goes above and below the x-axis increases. In fact, at an amplitude of 2, the maximum height above and the minimum height below the center of oscillation, sort of the midline of our trig function, is 2. It goes 2 units above, 2 units below. The same thing is true for cosine. We can take a look at the cosine graph here. And again, you can see that as a result of the amplitude, instead of going up one and down one from its center of oscillation, the cosine graph also has a, a maximum height now of two and a minimum height of minus two. And if we were to further increase the amplitude for both of these graphs, 
you can see that they grow in a corresponding way. In, if I bring it up, for example, to 5, you can see again that the, the graph travels up a height 5 units above the x-axis and 5 units below the x-axis, giving us a, a total distance from one end of the graph to the other, a total height of 10 units. We'll get rid of the cosine graph here for a moment and just focus on the sine graph. And what I'd like to do is look at what happens if we make the amplitude even smaller. So here we come down to an amplitude of 1 and we're back to where we started. We're back to our original sine graph. This is the original sine graph again. Goes up to a maximum of 1 down to a minimum of minus 1. What happens if I make the amplitude even smaller? What happens is I continue to decrease the amplitude. Let's take a look. When I decrease the amplitude further, you can see that the graph actually flattens out. So the maximum height now is no longer 1. It actually gets flatter and flatter. In fact, I can send the amplitude all the way down to 0. And at 0, we actually have a perfectly flat line. We have the flat line y equals 0. But what happens if I make the amplitude negative? What happens if I continue to decrease the amplitude past 0? What is our function going to, to look like then? Well, let me start here with our function a little bit above. And as the amplitude passes through 0, you see that the function actually ends up reflecting across the x-axis. So here we see an amplitude of minus 1. You can see that instead of going up initially from the origin as we go to pi over 2, instead of going up to 1, it goes down to minus 1. So the function has been reflected about the x-axis. And we can see the same thing for cosine as well. Instead of having a maximum at 0, cosine would have a minimum at 0 of minus 1. And of course, if we continue to decrease the amplitude further, make it more negative, you can see that the reflected graph becomes taller and taller. The amplitude actually gets, gets larger. The maximum and minimum heights that the graph travels increases. Well, let's bring it back to our normal graphs and let's summarize what we have what we have seen so far. So here with this particular graph of y equals 3 sine x, we can we can now say what's going to happen. This function is going to move a maximum height of 3 units above and 3 units below the x-axis. So what it's going to do is it's going to be a dilation. It's going to be a stretch. Every point now is three times three times farther away from the x-axis than it was. So the points that were at the x-axis don't move at all. So this is a very important thing as we go to solve trigonometric equations later on to see that these points, these zeros, don't move because of the amplitude change. Okay. But every other point gets three times farther from the origin than it was to begin with, or three times farther rather from the x-axis um, than it was. So this is, this is the effect that a change in amplitude has. So the summary we can make here is if we have something like y equals a times the sine of x, and this will apply equally well for the cosine of x, for y equals a sine of x, the function rises to a maximum value of A and a minimum value of minus A. A minimum value here of negative A. So in some ways this A value sets an upper and a lower bound on the, on the size of the trig function. The trig function kind of stays because it's a periodic function. It stays sandwiched in between the, the maximum and minimum value. And the amplitude simply tells you where to put that maximum line and where to put that minimum line. This will change a little bit later on as we look at other transformations. But for today, this is fine. That this A tells us how far above and how far below the x-axis the, the function will actually travel. So this is one of the transformations we're going to see today. And we got to see an example of that. We'd like to look at